The scripture lesson this morning is from John chapter 5. It's one of the, the events in Jesus' life that John uses to demonstrate that he is, in fact, the one, the chosen one whom Israel has been waiting for, God's Messiah. And it has to do with a, a lame man at a pool in Jerusalem called Bethesda. And there was a, a popular, um, popular belief that at a certain time every year an angel would come down and trouble the surface of the water. And the first one there, if there was something wrong with them, if they got in the water, they would be healed. And so in some of the older translations, you see uh, an additional verse or two added to explain what's going on here. But that wasn't evidently in the first manuscripts. It was one of those little marginal inserts that a scribe wrote in there to explain what was going on. And the next person that translated says, oh, this must be in here. So they put it in here and that manuscript got translated or transmitted down to us. But in the oldest manuscripts, the text reads as I'm about to read here. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Um, so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. The word of the Lord, la palabra del Señor. Thanks be to God. Gracias a Dios. Have any of you all seen the movie Risen? Uh, about, it, it's a really a good movie. It's about a, a Roman soldier, a tribune, who is sent to find the body of Jesus after, after his resurrection. And to you know, dispel the rumors that, that Jesus had been raised from the dead. But near the end of the movie, there's a, a time when, when this, this man, who has now seen Jesus raised from the dead, but he asks one of the disciples, he says, well, why, do you follow, why did you follow Jesus? And about that time, you know, there's a disturbance because there's a leper um, getting chased out away from the people, and, and Jesus sees him, you know, goes over and, and heals the person. And afterwards, then the guy just kind of says, that's why. Uh, you know, the Bible is just so full of, of stories of Jesus' healing. And um, throughout the Gospels, we see numerous times that he, that he healed people and, and lots of stories. But they, in many cases, sometimes they would, the people would see Jesus and they would call out to him and, and you know, Son of David, have mercy on me or Son of, you know, have pity on me, like the, the ten lepers that we read about recently. And, you know, they cried out, have pity on me. Um, there's a story of, of blind Bartimaeus, and, and um, he also said, you know, have, son of David, have mercy on me. And in that case, then Jesus came to him, and, and he asked, but he asked him a question. He said, well, what do you want me to do for you? You think, well, he's blind. Wouldn't that be obvious? But yet Jesus wanted the man to, to speak his need and, and to say what it really was that he wanted. You know, in this story, we see Jesus just coming to a place where there are lots of, of invalids and disabled people lying around and waiting for this water. Um, they must have believed that there was some uh, healing power that the water had, whether it was a mineral spring or what, we don't really know. But yeah, this, this um, 
story that, that an angel would come and stir up the waters. But it's an interesting story because, uh, you know, if Jesus just coming there, it doesn't tell us that he healed anybody else who was there that day. There were lots of people who needed healing. And why did he go just to this particular man? Um, you know, we, we don't really know. I mean, this man, it says he's been there for 38 years. And um, Jesus coming to him and, and discovering that, learning that he'd been there that long. And that, so he asks him a question. He says, well, do you want to get well? I was like, well, you know, he's, he's been showing up. I mean, his persistence has there, even though, you know, he's, he doesn't have the ability to get into the water at the time, but somehow he manages to get to that pool every day. But he's been there for 38 years, and he keeps on. We don't know. It, did the man cry out to God? Has he been praying for healing? Is that why Jesus shows up that day? We don't really know. It doesn't tell us. But he has, you know, Jesus' question isn't really so off the wall. Um, when he asks, you know, do you want to get well? I mean, you've been there for 38 years. Do we really want this thing to happen? And, you know, that's a question that we have to ask even ourselves sometimes when we're going through a difficult time or having a struggle, um, we might cry out for help, but it's like, well, do we really want to get well? You know, I've never been through, you know, 12-step programs. I don't know all that much about them, except that I know that that is an important early step in the process for people with addictions. If you want to get free from this addiction, you have to want it inside. You have to really be um, want to have a change and make a change in your life because otherwise it's not going to happen. You can go through treatment and revolving door in and out of treatments and different kinds of things, but until the person is really ready for change in their lives, it, it just isn't going to happen. And so, you know, I mean, it doesn't even have to be that drastic. I think of, you know, I, okay, the last couple of years I've put on a few pounds and I'm not happy about that, but um, to actually make a change would be you know do I want to get well do I want to lose these extra pounds you know am I willing to change my eating habits not so much just yet so it's like well do I really want it you know you so I got to get to that place yet and I'm just not there so Jesus asked this man do you want to be well and then he says the man's well but I Yes, he wants to be, I can't, I, I'm unable, I, I bring myself here, I get to the pool, but I can't, anytime I try to get into the water, somebody else beats me to it, i just not able. He needs some help, he needs some help. Um, we can only do so much, sometimes we get into a place where we've got to have help in order to get well, and to be able to admit that and to recognize our need, and to be able to ask for help can be a good thing. And so this man, you know, this is a, a real challenge in our, in our world sometimes, knowing how much help to give to somebody and when is the right amount of help or, you know, what should we do? This last week, um, I was at a ministerial association meeting and um, the mayor of Arlington came to the meeting and to talk with us about what's happening um, the efforts that the city is making to try and um, deal with our problem with homelessness and, and drug addiction particularly. And there's just a lot of, of struggle there. And she knows that one of the big challenges that we have is, is for the drug addiction is we don't have um, treatment and detox. There's not enough beds for, for people. And so when they have that moment, which can be just a short moment, when they say, yes, I'm ready, I'm ready to get well. Yes, I want to get well. Um, we say, Great, that's fine. We'll put your name on this waiting list. And when a bed comes available, and it's like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It doesn't happen because um, later that night, they're going to need another fix. And, and you know, then it, that moment is gone. So that's one thing we have to do is try and get more treatment options for people so that uh, to make it available so we can catch them when they are ready to get help and provide them the help that they need. You know, one of the other pastors there was saying, well, you know, but what about personal responsibility? And, and you know, and, and then they make bad choices and, and they got themselves into this fix. And it's like, well, you know, maybe so. And in some, a lot of cases, yeah, probably so. Not all cases. Sometimes they got that way through no fault of their own or, or just, you know, because of, of being 
prescribed bad medications that are pain, you know, those, those opioids. But, um, but they, they still need help. They're at that place where they need to have some help. A while back, there was a few months ago, I think there was a TV show. One of the news stations did a, a documentary, a program on the homeless in Seattle. And as they talked with the various people and just heard their stories, yeah, there were some that are just kind of stuck in that place and, and probably are not too interested in getting well and, and moving beyond that point. But there were a lot of folks that, that really are ready to get out of their situation, but they need that helping hand. They need somebody or some kind of a service or something to come alongside and just give them that helping hand so they can get back on their feet and become productive members in society again. And I know it's not easy for us to know always when is, is helping too much and when do we need to do that. But, you know, the, the um, rule of thumb is, of course, is if you're, you're, you're not really helping if you do something for someone that they have the ability to do for themselves. And so that's where we have to make that determination and see, you know, if they're not able to make a plan to think about what they have to do, you know, how can we come alongside them even to help to fill out paperwork so that they'll get the services that they need? You know, little things to help people out of their situation. You know, this man needed help. He wasn't able to get into the pool. But Jesus came along, uh, gave him the help. Then Jesus, what does he say to the man? He says, um, take up your mat, get up, take up your mat and walk. Um, he doesn't, he didn't say, here, let me help you up. He didn't say, give me your, here, I'll carry your mat for you. He said, no, take up your mat and walk. And so he's acknowledging that this man has a role to play in his own healing too, that he has a task that he can do, that he can participate in this as well. And he needs to do his part in this as well and take up the mat and go back to work and be able to do that. And so you know, we want to partner with people and help where we can help, but then also recognize there's some of this work they've got to do for themselves. You, you can't, I know this is the most frustrating thing for people who have family members who are heading down a bad path like this because you, can, you can't help them completely until they're ready to help themselves as well. You can only do so much and then um, it's got to be in their hands at some point. And I know how challenging that can be for folks um, when you, you just can feel so helpless. But uh, at our pastor spouse retreat, um, the man who was the, the worship leader, um, leading the music and such, shared just a, a little bit of his testimony that he also one time had been homeless on the streets down in California strung out on drugs um, but he's come to Christ and he's gotten free and and is clean and now you know he is the worship pastor at a church in Bellingham and so you know back to being a gainfully employed and a taxpayer and all of that kind of stuff and this is so encouraging to me because we've heard these stories before we know of others you know from our own Methodist superintendent who who said that he had had that that uh, particular problem and, and passage. A couple of the pastors in town have shared that's their testimony as well, that they've come from a drug culture and gotten free. And so it helps us to know that, you know what? It's possible. God can redeem these people. And these are not throwaway people. These are people that are precious in God's sight. There was a letter to the editor just a few weeks ago in the Everett Herald where someone asked, he said, you know, why should we even care? about these people that are on heroin. Why, why even care? So what if they die of an overdose? Because, you know, it just reduces the, the problem. Um, and it's like, well, here's why we care. It's because, you know, there's lots of reasons. First, because these are people who are created in the image of God. These are people who are loved by God, loved so much that God sent his one and only son to die for these people because the blood of Christ is available for these folks. These people are important because they are our sons and daughters. They're members of our community and such. 
They are precious in God's sight. And God can redeem them. God can do it. And he can bring healing. And so I think it's like the Lord has given me a burden here lately of, of prayer for these folks. Um, we need to begin, yes, praying for these people that those chains of bondage will be set free because only Christ can bring the healing that they really need. Um, and so to pray for them, but, you know, is there anything else we can do? How can we as a church really help to share the love of Christ with these people? You know, we've got groups that are meeting here in our church. We open our facility and allow um, the AA group on, at noon on Thursdays and the NA group, Narcotics Anonymous, that meet in the evenings on Thursdays. And they already are here in our building. Um, and, I, and I understand that, again, 12-step, that they, they turn to, they look to a higher power to help them um, be free. Because knowing, again, we don't have the strength, they don't have the strength to do it themselves. We have to look to that higher, higher power. Well, how can we let them know that this higher power is a person and he has a name and his name is Jesus and to help to introduce them to Jesus because this is where the chains are going to be broken and they will be set free. Um, this man that was at our, spa, our retreat, I had a, a, few, a brief conversation with him afterwards and, and he uh, offered to come to Arlington and share his testimony and, and maybe do a concert for us. And, and so I'm excited about that. I'm thinking, what can we do? I might need some help from y'all to help with planning this, um, whether we can do it with a youth group or, or um, with the NA group. People, how can we get this word out to folks to, that they'll come and they'll um, have that opportunity to have an encounter with Christ and have hope to find that there is hope for them in Jesus Christ because, you know, they... That's the trouble. People get into this situation where they just are without hope that they can ever get out. I'm amazed that this man in this story continued to come for 38 years. He continued somehow to have hope that he could be healed, I think. That was why he's showing up there every day for all of these years. People have to have hope, and the hope is in Jesus Christ and in him alone. So how can we share that with folks and let them know you know, there is a God who loves them, who considers them valuable, precious people, that they can be redeemed, they can be put back into society and become productive members of our society again, and maybe be called even into ministry to serve God um, and help others to find that path too. You know, we all have our struggles. We all have our areas where we um, need healing from the Lord. We have to ask, you know, do we really want it? Do we want it enough to come to Christ and ask for help? Do we need help? Are we able to ask one another for help and say, you know, can you, I need help in this area. I'm just not able to carry this burden by myself. But then also, are we willing to do our part, to step up and do the work that we need to do, to be obedient to Christ? If he tells us it tells me to, to cut out that sugar, those donuts or whatever, to be obedient and say, yes, Lord, um, may it be so. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our healer, that you are the one who is able to heal people. We believe these stories. We believe, Lord, that you really did heal people in the Bible. And so we trust and believe that you are able to do that still today. And so, Father, help thou our unbelief. Help us to trust in you and to grow in our faith. And, Lord, we do pray for all of those in our community. This morning, I just want to lift up all of those who are struggling with addictions. Father, that they would not lose hope, but they would know that they can be set free by the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us to share that word with them in some way. I would ask, Father, for a door to be opened for the way, the pathway to be made clear, how we can touch the lives of these folks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.